been joining. I'm just fighting with computers at this end, but I think I'm, I can see you and I'm assuming you can see me. We can, Alec. And you know what? At least you weren't fighting with traffic. So there's a saving grace there. <laughs> so. That's right. Good. No, no, no. It's, uh, it was just a technical problem, but I've just, they, they changed my computer yesterday. So I have a new computer, which is, um, which is presenting new challenges for me, but that's all right. That's okay. Good. That's the world we live in now. So Indeed. that means we can all be very, very patient with each other, which is I'm going to exhort everyone to be patient with me tonight as well as I navigate uh, the digital world and this fourth industrial revolution that we're, we're in now. So Alec has joined us. So I am delighted to welcome everyone tonight to the fourth annual Lunar Society Sir Adrian Cadbury Lecture where we hold in line with our mission are uh, an apolitical organization that was set up to stimulate ideas, broaden debate and to catalyze action. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Deirdre Labassier and I am just so thrilled to welcome you in my capacity as the current chair of the Lunar Society. So I thought we'd just start with a few house rules now the event is being recorded. So if you wish to be anonymous, please just turn your cameras off. Um, there is a mute button there, which will be on when the speakers are talking. When it comes to the question time part of the evening, you are welcome to use the mute button other than when you yourself are speaking. And that button can be found on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you wish to make a point or to ask a question, you can signal to myself that you want to speak by using the reactions button to send a thumbs up, or you can raise your hand and I will do my best to see you, but I have to admit, I will also be relying on um, David Clark, uh, our secretariat to help me to, to see everyone because I may not be able to see everyone on the screen. You're also welcome to show your agreement and your appreciation with what a speaker is saying by using the hand clapping facility. You know, it's interesting, Zoom doesn't have a thumbs down facility, but of course we won't need that tonight, I'm sure. And you can also use the instant messaging chat feature. And I would really encourage you to do that because it will allow you to ask um, me questions um, and also to comment on something while another person is speaking. And we found it's a fantastic way to engage with other members of, uh, of, of the audience on, on, the, um, on the Zoom. So please do use the instant messaging chat feature um, for any questions or comments. Now we're gonna to aim to finish at eight o'clock tonight. Um, and the last thing that I would say is that given that we are in this digital world, one of the things that we found is that people actually were commenting whilst um, the event was happening on social media. So if you are going to comment on social media, what I would ask you to do is to use the hashtag Lunar Society, use hashtag governance and use hashtag Sir Adrian Cadbury. If you're going to be tweeting, um, you can always tweet and use our handle at Luna Sock. And of course, you can um, find us on LinkedIn and on Facebook as well. Great. Oh, I'm so excited. Right. So tonight uh, actually launches two incredible things. We're launching a white paper which arises out of a governance inquiry into the 12 principles of good governance as purported and put forward by the Governance Forum through Dr. Carl George MBE. And we are also honored that Dr. Carl George has chosen the forum of the Lunar Society to launch the Race Equality Code tonight. So without further ado, I think I'll just make some introductions of our esteemed speakers tonight. So I'll introduce you first to Professor Alec Cameron. Alec is the Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive of Aston University, who would normally be hosting us physically at the university. 
by now we would have been just making our way into the room, having had a fantastic uh, cocktail of wine and or orange juice and some canapes. But sadly tonight, I'm just having my cup of tea. But nevertheless, Alec as a fantastic host has been hosting us uh, for the last four years at Aston University. Alec commenced as vice chancellor and chief exec in September, 2016. He's a Rhodes Scholar who had a distinguished career in Australia, holding positions including Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education at the University of Western Australia, President of the Australian Business Dean's Council and Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of South Wales. Indeed, the Professor Alec Cameron Prize for Excellence was established at the University of New South Wales in recognition of his significant contribution to the institution and community. We are really blessed to have Professor Cameron at Aston University and hosting the Lunar Society as a key member of Midlands Innovation, a world-class research and innovation partnership combining the collective excellence of leading universities in the heart of the UK. He's a board member of Innovation Birmingham and also a member of the UK's International Policy Network and Innovation and Growth Policy Network. We also have speaking tonight, Dr. Carl George. Carl is a leading advisor and commentator on governance globally, and he provides varied organizations with his expert advice on the enhancement and implementation of governance codes. This man is a thought leader and internationally established governance consultant and the managing director of the Governance Forum. Carl created the governance assessment process, which was actually endorsed by Sir Adrian Cadbury and he has had many awards and has a kite mark in governance. Carl's innovation and passion for the importance and relevance of governance has established him and earned him the name as the governor. He's the creator of the effective board member programs which have been delivered across the world. He's been conferred honorary doctorate. He's a visiting professor. He's an established author. He's a sought after speaker and he's a community champion and of course the creator of the board game. Carl is also the creator of the 12 principles of governance, which was what we looked into in the governance inquiry and the race equality code, which we are discussing tonight. And then of course our principal speaker, the right honorable Liam Byrne MP for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Liam, is the shadow mayor for the West Midlands. He is the chair of the Global Parliamentary Network of the IMF and World Bank, and the Gwilym Gibbon Research Fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford. A former cabinet min minister, Liam undertook what some might say was one of the toughest jobs in the last Labour government at the Home Office, where as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, he coordinated cross-government programs to combat the great financial crisis. In opposition, Liam served in a number of front bench positions. He's chaired Labour's policy review. He's founded and chaired the all party parliamentary group on inclusive growth and served on the Council of Europe. Liam is one of Westminster's leading authorities on China he helped kickstart the economic and finance dialogue and he's co-founded the UK China Young Leaders Roundtable. And tonight he is delivering the Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture. I wish to acknowledge also the presence of the Cadbury family here tonight. We are delighted to have amongst us the son of Sir Adrian Cadbury, Benedict Cadbury, without whose support through the George Cadbury Fund and the other members of the Cadbury family the Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture and indeed the governance inquiry and ensuing white paper would not be possible. So we do thank you. So I mentioned before that Aston University would be hosting this evening in the real world if we were able to be there tonight. Uh, however, we are enjoying our own cups of teas or glasses of wine. And in doing so, I invite you to give a warm welcome to Professor Alec Cameron to address us 
on the history of this lecture. Alec. Thanks, Deirdre, and I will be quite brief. Um, can I firstly, once again, welcome you to the, the uh, Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture. I was going to say at Aston University, we are the, um, I suppose I'd say the traditional host for this lecture, and I'll go into a bit of background as, as to why that's the case. Um, but notwithstanding the, the fact that you aren't unfortunately on campus with us tonight, um, like so many other events, this is an, an online activity, but um, nonetheless, we are very pleased to be identified as the venue host, albeit the online venue host. I'd like to, to thank our friends at the Lunar Society for inviting Aston to host this important lecture. And I do think it's very apt that this series of lectures is and has been in the past held at Aston University. Like the Lunar Society, Aston University sees itself as a place where inquiring minds from Birmingham and beyond can meet, debate, and come up with solutions to critical problems which are facing it all, us all. We are also, of course, uh, very cognizant that this lecture series is named after Sir Adrian Cadbury. Um, and Sir Adrian has a long and distinguished past with Aston University. Sir Adrian was actually a member of the governing body of Aston University, the University Council for many years, and was the chancellor, uh, which is the ceremonial figurehead of the university from 1979 until 2004, so 25 years. The university, the, the, the head of Aston University uh, was Sir Adrian Cadbury. Um, he also participated actively in the university. He was, um, he taught in the business school. He was involved in some undergraduate and postgraduate uni courses at the university, speaking particularly on governance, of course, which is very topical given tonight's um, area of address business ethics and corporate social responsibility. So areas in some sense which, with which Sir Adrian and I would say the Cadbury family have been long identified. Sir Adrian was also president of the Students' Athletic Union um, at Aston, very appropriate given his sporting prowess as an Olympic rower who actually represented Great Britain in 1952, which if my recollection is right, would be the Helsinki Olympics. Um, and indeed our new Aston Students' Union building on our campus is named the Sir Adrian Cadbury Building. Um, he also, not surprisingly, given this, his close relationship with the university, is one of the university's most generous philanthropists. Uh, and he was chair of the university's development board from 2007 until shortly before his death. And his vision and leadership contributed markedly to Aston University. Now, there is no doubt um, that the current pandemic has forced us all to reevaluate the way in which we operate. And so once again, whilst it's always an honour to welcome guests to the campus, clearly this wasn't possible this year. Um, having said that, suffice to say as a university, we have been operating with our lectures being online now since about March. So about seven months now, we've actually been operating uh, much of our education in an online mode, although we are now in, in what we call a blended mode where we have some elements of on-campus teaching, but nonetheless, much is still online. And we are, as a consequence, very pleased that the Lunar Society now has also been able to offer this uh, lecture in these very different times and that they've been able to, to do that uh, on an online platform. I am also not the, the person who's formally introducing uh, Liam Byrne, MP, um, as our main speaker this evening, but he is very welcome at the university. In fact, I reasonably early in my tenure met with Liam in my office and you know, had a, a very interesting and engaging discussion with him. Um, Liam, of course, is gonna be talking about the race equality code and why the focus on race is appropriate at this time. And once again, this is something which is very pertinent to Aston University. Um, Aston University has actually the largest percentage population of black and minority ethnic students of any university in the UK. Almost 70% of our students identify as, as uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic. So uh, we are very conscious that we, we exist within a very diverse city and we consequently are a very diverse university and we are very proud of the mix of students that we attract and the success that we achieve with them. Aston University has recently signed up to the Race Equality Charter uh, and the work in this area alongside our ongoing work with Athena Swan, which is a, 
a program to recognize good practice in higher education and research institutions towards the advancement of gender equality. Uh, those two elements are central to our embedding equality into all areas of, of life at Aston. And I'm very much looking forward to, to Liam's perspectives because I know not only is he a deep thinker on this, but I'm also conscious that his, um, his seat uh, comprises both, uh, well, great diversity across the area that he is responsible for. So this, Liam, no doubt, is not just a, a philosophical interest, but it's very real in terms of his constituents. Um, but before that, as, as Deidre has said, um, Deidre and Carl are going to launch the white paper on corporate governance and introduce race equality code. So I'm very happy now, Deirdre, to hand back to you, once again, welcoming everybody to this lecture this evening, uh, Liam and everyone who has come to hear him speak. Uh, but Deirdre, welcome to Aston. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, very much, very appreciated. Um, so as Alec said, we're launching um, the race equality code, but we're also launching the uh, white paper, uh, which was produced pursuant to a um, governance inquiry that we undertook through the Lunar Society. Now, I think many of us here tonight probably might remember 1992. I was quite young at the time, um, and I'm sure many of you share that my youth. <laughs> um, but at that time, I remember watching television and seeing a man named Rodney King being beaten and being the victim of police brutality in America. And further to seeing that happen, I watched him again giving a um, talk on television and he said these words, can't we all just get along? And that's a challenge that I think we've been trying to, whether Black, White, Jewish, Asian, Hispanic, we've been trying to answer that question to level up to equality, but we're clearly still not there yet. We're at a point in time where we need to be codifying moral, ethical, and cultural norms into the framework of how we govern our organizations. And it's with that in mind that we are going to be hearing from Carl, who will be introducing us to the Race Equality Code, and that we'll be hearing from Liam, who will be delivering this Adrian Cadbury lecture, discussing the importance of equality in governance. Now, there have been many momentous periods in, in history, and just before we came on, Liam and I were actually discussing how momentous we are in this period of history and that we're in this state of uh, parallels of flux and change at the same time. Some of us are actually at a stage in our lives where we may have lived through a few momentous periods of history. And many of those periods were times of emotional, physical, and even indeed spiritual tension. The problems of the world seemed gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail. We're going through that yet again. We're in the middle of a pandemic where we have seen throughout the world a shift in culture in terms of race and ideologies and it's a moment where it seems to be more important now than ever that leaders of organizations make the right decisions where we must consider accountability for the future. It was therefore within the spirit of Sir Adrian Cadbury, the father of governance, who in publishing the Cadbury Code of Governance in 1992, was very much about securing accountability for the future. And it is in that spirit that the Lunar Society chose to commission a governance inquiry from which we have produced the white paper. So the white paper, which you will all receive in your inboxes after this meeting, was produced further to the governance inquiry, which was set up to discuss whether it was possible to have a set of governance principles that are actually fit 
for future boards and applicable across multiple jurisdictions. I know, ambitious. This was done in the context of what is called Governance 3.0. And the 12 principles of good governance, which was published by Dr. Carl George of the Governance Forum in association with the Chartered Governance Institute. Little did we know when the executive committee of the Lunar Society were in the planning stages with Carl in December 2020 and securing Dr. Abigail Robson of Central Consultancy to conduct the research and write, write the white paper that we would be living the future now. So tonight is my opportunity first to thank the contributors, some of whom are on the call tonight, without whom the inquiry would not have been possible. I'd like to thank Carl, the author of Governance 3.0 and the 12 Governance Principles. And I'd also like to thank Sir Michael Lyons, who sadly couldn't be with us tonight for his illuminating forward. And of course, Dr. Robson for capturing the views of the respondents so transparently. So what was this governance inquiry all about? The aim of the inquiry was to challenge and to investigate two things. Firstly, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution and to make room for cognitive diversity in its purest sense. And that included making room for generations Y and Z, shaping that new generation in governance thinking, particularly after corporate failures resulting from blind spot and dictatorial governance to move to governance 3.0, a more organizationally integrated framework. The second thing was to challenge and investigate the assumption that one set of governance principles can be applicable across sectors, sizes of businesses, maturity of business or geographical jurisdiction. It was proposed by the Governance Forum that this challenge could be met through the adoption of the 12 principles of good governance, and that could improve organizational outcomes through a comprehensive and flexible approach to governance. In conducting the research, it was found that many organizations operate with a tick box approach to compliance. Surprise, I know. <laughs> but that actually obviously presents challenges. An added challenge is the impact of the fourth industrial revolution and how to practically apply good governance principles within that context. And many organizations have actually found themselves as a matter of necessity in the current climate that we are in, having to navigate the digitalization of the governance framework. The inquiry also investigated the nature of organizational cultures that boards set and operate within, and the attitudes of governance practitioners to the solutions offered by the 12 principles. The focus of the inquiry was on obtaining practitioners' views on those key opportunities within the 12 principles and the key challenges involved. Of course, we had to carry it out as a matter of necessity and safety within this pandemic via online group discussions, which were held as a part of a series of seminars with governance practitioners to include PricewaterhouseCoopers, Middle East region, the Chartered Governance Institute, West Midlands Steering Group, the Chartered Institute of Housing, Trowers and Hamlin, Joseph Chamberlain Foundation, Birmingham City University, and RSM Birmingham, to name but a few. So the principles were tested, and the findings were, in a nutshell, that good governance is central to the success of every organization, no matter how small, how complex, where it's based, or what it does. I think we could all agree with that. It was also found that these 12 principles encompassing three key areas within the framework being competencies, resources, and execution actually make it easier to ensure that the key principles of what constitute good governance is more easily and readily available. And I can testify to this because I have myself actively adapted this framework within my organization to drive board and committee effectiveness and efficiencies. And I can tell you it works. One of the nuances arising from the conversations amongst the respondents was the recognition 
that society and its citizens can benefit from effective and efficient governance mechanisms, but they can equally fall foul of the challenges faced by complicated, suboptimal, over-bureaucratic structures. Greed, nepotism, and conflicting motivations have seen catastrophic failures in the private sector, and that's spilled over into society at large. There are so many organizations and institutions that were deemed too big to fail, and the governance of those organizations demand sophisticated risk monitoring and assurance gathering to meet the requirements of the rapidly changing environment that we're in now. Also, it was found that the business landscape is obviously changing dramatically and technology is providing greater opportunities, but it's also disrupting traditional business and governance models which are struggling to keep up. As the baby boomers retire, and Generation X begin to make their mark in the boardroom. It's Generations Y and Z that are the new talent pipeline. And indeed, race diversity is key to engage true diversity of thought. Understanding and recognizing that we must make room for them is the biggest challenge since cognitive diversity is becoming business critical. We had some local authorities involved in this inquiry. And we found that many local authorities are juggling housing, education, and social care priorities, and that they're now having to forge new relationships and collaborations at the same time. Whilst juggling priorities and collaborations with NHS trusts, housing associations, or private sector contractors, local authorities must still ensure that they continue to provide the best care the best accommodation, security to tenants, patients, pupils, and members of society to avoid being lost. Where then can failure in any organization normally be traced back to? Usually it's governance and leadership. Governance, it is submitted, is not just about adherence to the rules and regulations, and it cannot be designated to a function or a department within an organization. One major finding, therefore, was that governance should be integrated across the whole organization. It is much more than the management of the processes, although that is important. It's much more than having systems in place Although, again, that is important. Governance is about the systems and controls in place to ensure an organization is managed efficiently and effectively. It's about the strategic oversight of the board and their coexistence with the executive, with operational staff and members within that organization. It's about the attitudes of the board members the management of risk, the receiving of assurance and standards in public life. What all corporate governance principles do is set out how organizations can arrange or design themselves, both in terms of structure and process to make the best decisions possible. That doesn't mean that if an organization adopts best corporate governance principles, it's guaranteed to make the best decisions possible but it should minimize the risk of bad decision-making. It was found that the 12 principles of governance build upon that to support organizations to not just go through the motions of following best practice, to maximize efficiencies and effectiveness to support the building of the good culture and attitude of those involved in the decision-making processes. So on a personal note, I found that this exercise emphasized to me and the other respondents, how important it is that we can and should learn from different sectors and taking the good practice and using it to improve what we are doing, ensuring that we are responding to the environmental, social and governance influences that so many stakeholders, including investors, are insisting upon in relation to our reporting and how we govern our organizations. So lastly, I would like to convey my sincere thanks once again to the contributors, Dr. Abigail Robson of Central Consultancy, 
Dr. Carl George, MBE, Sir Michael Lyons and the George Cadbury Fund. And I declare the white paper launched. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. So you should all be receiving, hopefully by the magic of um, technology, you should all be receiving in your inboxes the, um, the white paper. And I promise you it's a, it's a riveting read. <laughs> so I'd like to now um, introduce Dr. Carl George, MBE. Um, and Carl is, uh, as I've said before, an incredible individual. And, and Carl produced the Race Equality Code, which we are really honored and delighted that he's launching tonight um, through the Lunar Society. And this Race Equality Code had been produced in response to governance challenges arising out of the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer. It's a accountability framework and how it might provide organizations with an opportunity to address the very specific challenge of race and diversity in the boardroom and within the governance structure of organizations informs the Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture tonight. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Carl George, MBE. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, and before I start, I just want to say how privileged I am to be here at the Sir Adrian Cadbury annual lecture. Um, and I've got to thank Steve Walker actually, because I was able to meet Sir Adrian and develop a relationship with him because of the time he served on the board that Stephen was with. And so I'm glad you're here, Steve. Um, and I want to thank the family uh, for allowing us to use today to talk about something that, as all of you know, gets me tingly, corporate governance. Um, I'm not going to speak today about the governance inquiry. I'm going to speak about another project that I've been very, very interested in because my lived experience has collided with my professional life. Corporate governance and me as a black man in society that really has made sure that we are here. And yes, thank you to the Cabri family. Um, let me share my screen. And I am gonna share some slides with you, but I'm not gonna be focusing too much on killing you with death by PowerPoint, as they say. But I think some of the visuals are very important. And the first thing I want to say now is the time to dismantle structural racism once and for all. It's long overdue the need to tackle the woeful lack of racial diversity in the leadership of many organizations in our city, in our region, around the world even. And now it's getting the time and attention that it deserves. Only today I was reading about 1% of the senior leaders in HSBC are black and similar statistics in NatWest. We hear about 70% of FTSE 250 companies not having one black person on their board. And football, 30% or 30 odd percent of the players are black, only 4% in leadership. Housing, an area that I do a lot of work in, where we find that something like 40% of the people on Don Wake, but 6% are in leadership. You see, I believe the solution, and the reason I get tingly, is somewhere in governance. I believe the solution to all of this is somewhere in systems. I believe the systems that direct and control from that first definition of corporate governance given by Sir Adrian Cabri in that Cabri report, that governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. And if we want to change some of those inequities, I think we need to tackle it right at the top of the organisation and we need some radical change and we need no more excuses because we can get a solution. So I've got to be careful because I get passionate about this and I get passionate about governance. And when the two things collide, who knows what's going to happen? 
There's a term that I heard first mentioned when I was studying Enron. Do you remember when Enron, about 10 years after Cadbury, um, world's, one of the world's largest utility companies, where the judge was talking to Kenneth Lay, the chief executive, and he said that you displayed willful blindness. This is where, if there's something that you should have known, something that you could have known, but you chose not to know, then you're still liable. And as I reflect on willful blindness, and I reflect on where we are with racial inequality, I'm also minded of the term willful ignorance. So this is the practice of almost blatantly avoiding, disregarding, or disagreeing with facts and empirical evidence just because of your own intellectual laziness or closed-mindedness or fear. And as I think of those two terms and I think of where we are, I say, actually, we've got to a time of history, a tipping point, as Malcolm Gladwell puts it eloquently in his book. The stickiness factor that he relates to has come about by an incident, a murder, some people have even said an assassination in the summer of this year. So I think that we owe it to ourselves to do something about where we go. So the Race Equality Call 2020 came about as a result of my lived and work experience coming together. It came about, and I won't cover today's statistics that some of you will be very familiar with, but black people, and when I say black, I mean African, African Caribbean, and black British. And when I say black and Asian, I'll be speaking about Asian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi separately. So we can understand that they all have different statistics that we can measure. And I was talking about this recently and somebody said, Carl, give us the stats so we understand what's going on. But there's been loads of reports, that's a technical term. There's been loads of statistics. I'm sick of all of that now, because we all know if we're not willfully ignorant, if we're not gonna be willfully blind, we know that at the bottom of all of those things, stop and search, six times more likely if you're black, um, longest prison sentences, coming out with your, um, your degree, you're not going to get into a Russell Group University like your white counterparts. Um, you're not going to be able to raise investment to the same level as if you're black. Even your living standards are going to be substandard or your net worth, as I read in Rountree, is going to be less. So I don't want to talk about the stats and the reports. I want to talk about what we're going to do about it. But to that end, and I heard Alex today that you'd adopted the Race at Work Charter. I looked at many of the charters and principles and pledges that are out there. My own diversity in the boardroom and some of the colleagues on the line today will have been involved with me when we asked Trevor Phillips and Raj Tolsiani of Green Park and a committee which included Midland Heart and KPMG to launch a pledge so that people could help to change diversity in the boardroom with a particular focus on race and gender and age. But the McGregor Smith Review with its 26 recommendations, the Parker Review with its six in the private sector, the Business and the Community, which has just had the Black Voices Report and the NHS Workforce Race Equality Standard with another nine. By the time I added them all up, there was 200 different recommendations and requirements and people say, well, what do we do? Because these pictures that I share with you, 800 million pounds coming or thereabouts coming into Birmingham and the senior leadership team at All White and the board, this significant number with one black man. And the statistics that I told you before are shared across sectors, across the NHS, across accounting, across law. And I just got with despair, I said, what can we do? And also minded of people saying to me, not another governance code. And I said, yes, another governance code, because there isn't one specifically that I could find that deals with race. So it's not in competition 
with all those charters and kite marks and pledges, but actually brings them together under one accountability framework with an apply and explain approach. And because I'm with an intellectual audience today, Deirdre, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about apply and explain and comply or explain, which I normally don't do. You see, the four principles that I'm gonna share with you in a moment, I expect organizations when they adopt the code to demonstrate how they will apply the principles that we're going to talk about. These principles are cross sector, they're cross size, they're cross jurisdiction. How do we apply them? It was King Four in South Africa that moved us away from apply or explain into apply and explain. And I think that's where we can stop the tick box attitude that we sometimes have to codes. So that's the first fundamental shift that every organization, once I've shared the principles with you, you'll decide that you can apply and explain. But then I've come up with, don't be scared, 55 provisions. And these provisions we comply or explain. So what that means is we can now decide, apart from the must, we can now decide whether those provisions will help us to get somewhere closer to dealing with that racial inequality. So I've got 20 musts, 20 things that we must do. Then I've got some shoulds, and then I've got some coulds. I say I, but I'll share with you the framework of people that have helped to develop the race equality code. So we comply or explain to the 55 provisions, but we apply and explain the four principles. And hopefully that is straightforward and makes sense. I have to give my thanks to a number of people and organizations and campaigners, um, the West Midlands branch of the Chartered Governance Institute. I see the previous chief executive is here, Simon. Um, thanks for attending. Um, I note that we have a number of early adopters of this code who our faith have said, we know about the code, we know it's new, but we're going to make sure that we are reflecting like the West Midlands Combined Authority, like the Birmingham City Council, like the Greater Business Chambers of Commerce, like Birmingham's women, Birmingham's and Solely Hall's Women's Aid, um, and like Trident Group and Nehemiah Housing Association, a number of organizations that have said, we're going to adopt this code and Doncaster NHS Trust. There's a focus group of people that I've spoken to individually and diversity consultants who've been working in this area for something like 35 years. And just to demonstrate that this is in competition with any of those codes, and you can see Lord Simon Woolley there, who's an advisor to me personally, but we see these people here who've reflected and been on the Parker Committee, or Yvonne who headed up the Workforce Race Equality Standard, or um, when we look at Caroline Waters, who is, who is currently interim chair at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, all these people, and in particular, Sandra Kerr, as we mentioned, the Race at Work Charter with business in the community, bringing all of these people together so that we could get one framework. And the principles that we adopt, I'm gonna share very quickly with you, are that we are talking about black. And as British, people, we sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about race. And when we say diversity sometimes, over in 2011, Lord Davis did some great work in terms of starting gender diversity. And we've had campaigns, not quotas, but we've had campaigns over those last 10 years, and we've seen a movement in gender diversity. But many of the codes that I've seen and, and quality marks talk about diversity, but mean gender a lot of the time. And I'm apologetically, unapologetically speaking about black, as I said before, because those statistics that bear me out demonstrate that we've got to make a move now, because this 
hasn't changed much in the last 30, 40 years. You see, we've got a responsibility of organizations to do something about the structural differences that have been created by the systems that we're working to. And it's not good enough, unfortunately, to be non-racist. We have to actually be anti-racist. If we think about the governance that I mentioned before, because if governance talks about systems and the systems are producing inequality, what we're gonna have to do is go back and change the systems, change the structures, change the norms so that we can get a different outcome. And how can you have integrity if in dealing with leadership, unless you look at yourself first? I showed you those pictures. So zero tolerance and the values that we have to espouse is that we're not taking black people on because it's a token and it's tokenism. Actually, there are people there with talent, with ability, who think differently, have the skills, and are able to contribute effectively. And all we're saying is give us an opportunity. Give us an opportunity to be able to contribute. The reality is this has been going on for 30, 40, 50 years. And what we've got to do now in this time in history, and we've got that stickiness factor that I mentioned before that gives you a tipping point. We've got the, all of the parameters now for us to make a change. I mentioned King Four before, and, and I, I, sorry, I apologize because I, I get tingly about corporate governance codes. And that's one of the codes that I really, really think is a groundbreaking code. But it reminds us of triple context. It reminds us of John Elkington's triple bottom line, which says that we don't just focus on profitability, we can focus on the people and the planet as well. And every organization, talks about and needs to understand that they have this dual, triple nature. And when we talked about Sir Adrian Cabri and what he specialised in at Aston University, governance, business ethics and corporate social responsibility, that's where the governance is coming into play. So I'll conclude. I'll conclude by talking to you about the four key principles. The first one being reporting. Come on, let's just report about race. Let, let's talk about what we can measure, we can then manage. Let's put it in our annual reports, even if it looks like we haven't achieved much yet. But then with that openness and the transparency, it's on our websites, it's in our employee forums, then we can do something about it. Let's take action and be accountable for those actions in this must, should, and could. And I know it's not the British way for me to tell you what to do with a governance code, but I really believe unless we do something radical at this time, we're not going to see the change. And it's gonna take another generation of me speaking to my son about the same things that I experienced as a teenager that he is now experiencing as a young man. That should not go for another generation. And we've got to get to the data. We've got to make sure that the composition of the boards and the leadership teams reflects society. We're in, a, in Birmingham. We're going to be a majority non-white city. So we can't have 40, 50% non-white. And then we're still looking at statistics that demonstrate our leadership is not representative. And that's because that means we're not getting to the talent. I do a lot of work in football. Um, I wanted an accountant as a son and, a, and an architect. <laughs> and I wanted a businessman. Um, I've got one that's into drama, another one that's a, um, into entrepreneurialism, which is good. And then one that's a footballer. And I mentioned the footballer because when the scouts came to see me when he was only 12 years old, I couldn't believe the amount of information that they had about him when they wanted to sign him. Because they went out of their way to find talent. That's what we see in the football industry. And that's why we see 30-40% of the players being black. To, to finish off then, we really need to think about, and I think a key component is education. 
We need to be, create safe environments and have clumsy agreements so that we can get the articulation and um, be able to speak eloquently about these matters of race. And not for you to think if I say white fragility or white privilege or I've seen sometimes people speak about in government things that we can and can't not say and teach. We've got to get the language right and get the understanding of what unconscious bias training may or may not be able to do and how we work together collectively to change the environment. There's a lot we need to do. So how did the code come together? Well, the four key sources amongst the other re reports and recommendations, like the CBI's change the race ratio, which came out very recently. But what I did is pull together these 26 of McGregor Smith, the 11 and two reports at um, race at work, the 13 with the two Parker reviews, and the nine with the workforce race equality standard. If you add that all up, it won't come to 55, by the way, because some of them will be duplicated. And then I've also used those different forums that I told you about to come up with our first discussion document that goes out to consultation after today. I'm so excited because in the spirit of Cadbury, um, Deidre mentioned I travel all over the world promoting corporate governance. I used to do it as the accountant, he used to get tingly about numbers, but now I'm the guy who gets tingly about corporate governance. And I'm so proud to be able to say I'm from Birmingham when people say to me, where do you live? Which part of London do you live actually? And I say to them, no, I live in Birmingham. And they say to me, why would you do that? But one of the reasons I can tell you that I'm so proud of when I speak about Cadbury and I speak about our UK corporate governance code now, that it is recognised and respected all over those 11 countries around the world that I've taught in. I see us doing a similar thing with our race equality code, a principle based framework that in three simple steps we can adopt. We examine those drivers that I mentioned to you as collective organisations to see where we stand. We apply and explain against those four principles and then we comply or explain on a must, should, could basis. So, fellow members of the Lunar Society, those of you who haven't joined, um, and we need you to get your memberships up to date. Um, and I've been told, told about that, I hear you, Deirdre. Um, but if we're not part of the solution, are we part of the problem? Thank you so much, Carl, for such um, a very passionate introduction to the race equality code. And I'm just going to do one very quick thing, um, Deirdre. Oh, so sorry. I do apologize. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Just very quickly, as, as I said, I'm so excited. This will become public domain today, tonight. It will be published, our press release. This is what it looks like. I can't believe it. It's here. So this is the Race Equality Code. Um, you will be able to get it and download from www.theracecode.org. It has the introduction, similar to what we just spoke about, the four principles of the governance code, how it's come together, and then the must, should, and could. People have been trying to get this out of me for weeks. It's finally in the public domain, and it will be as a part of a consultation exercise between now and early next year with those early adopters and with the people that I mentioned, the code steering group, but you can download it now. We've got our must, shoulds and coulds on the reporting, our must, shoulds and coulds on the action, our must, shoulds and coulds on the composition, and our must, shoulds and coulds on the education. But the most important thing is how to adopt the code so that you're able to measure in a year's time together with our Benchmark 20, uh, a national campaign where we're gonna compare all of your answers on the 20 must to see which things work, which things don't work. 
and I don't want to be this mad black activist who's doing crazy things, but I do want to see radical change. So there we have it, the corporate governance addition to what we need to do. And I want to thank the AICSA West Midlands chapter, the focus group that we've worked with, some of the race code consultants that I've worked with, the code steering group and the early adopters. And there's some resources of, have anybody heard about the 10,000 Black Interns Initiative that was just recently launched? There's Board Apprentice and our very own Effective Board Member Program, amongst other things. So without further ado, I will now hand back to the chair. Thank you so much, Carl. Really do appreciate it. I think that was just such an, um, uh, an inspiring and um, very, yeah, just, just incredibly inspiring um, code that you've developed. And I think what I really loved about it is that it's not prescriptive. It's something that organizations can take on board and apply their own nuances in relation to examining themselves, applying and explaining, and then complying or explaining. So I think um, this is a fantastic juncture to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, uh, the Right Honorable Liam Byrne. I mean, and I've, I've extolled Liam's virtues already, but just to, to just let people understand who this man is. He's a writer, he's a reformer, he's a campaigner. He's the Labour MP for Birmingham Hodge Hill, which is a very diverse, has a very diverse demographic in, in Birmingham. And he's a former cabinet minister who served in the Home Office, number 10 Downing Street and with Her Majesty's Treasury. Liam's going to be addressing the issue of race and diversity, and he's going to be talking about why the race equality code is so important and why the focus on race is appropriate at this time and consider not excluding wider diversity. So I hand you over to Liam Byrne. Um, Dizzy, thanks very much. And uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a real privilege, actually, and a real honour for me to, um, to follow Carl. I feel very much like an afterword um, tonight. And so uh, I'm, I'm sorry that you've had the main gig and, and now you've got to listen to me um, for a few minutes to follow that magnificent presentation up. Um, I was really privileged to uh, be able to spend a bit of time with Carl um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I think the code is, is fantastic. I'll do whatever I can. Uh, to support it. But the, uh, the case I want to, to make to you tonight, and, and the reason I was happy to come along and, and speak really, um, is because I think that we should lead the implementation of this code from here in Birmingham, in the West Midlands. And in so doing, I think that we should set out to reclaim our mantle, a mantle which we have lost, uh, to reclaim our mantle as the pioneer of civic capitalism. And I want to rest my argument tonight on um, a story about the past, uh, an analysis of the future, uh, and an argument about how we in the here and now uh, can build a different kind of future um, based on the inspiration um, of our past. So um, let me start with a word about our past because um, it's a great honor for me to speak at this Adrian Cadbury lecture tonight. Adrian. Uh, was a magnificent rower, uh, he was a magnificent business person, but he was a reformer. He saw the world as it could be and argued that things should change. And in that spirit, Adrian was very much um, in keeping with the best traditions um, of our city. Now, I think that Matthew Bolton would have welcomed what you're doing here tonight, Deirdre. So um, as many of you will know, as members of the Lunar Society, uh, the great philosophical feast that happened at the time of the full moon. Um, it, it sort of started early and, and, and went on late and often carried through into the next morning, but it brought together some of the best innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists and thinkers in the world who wanted to do things differently in exactly the way that you are here tonight. So um, long may this tradition, this new tradition of a, of, of a digital philosophical feast continue um, perhaps not late into the night and into tomorrow morning, but um, uh, at least until eight o'clock. So 
I want to start my story with Bolton because the last time um, I came to talk to the Lunar Society, it was to uh, it was to launch a book called Dragons, which is um, a history of our economy uh, told through the lives of 10 of our uh, greatest entrepreneurs. And obviously, being from Birmingham, Bolton had to go in there. Um, but what Bolton helped do, together with James Watt and Wedgwood and many of the people that worked with him at the Soho Manufactory, um, was not just help spark the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they helped spark a new tradition of civic capitalism. So when the Soho Manufactory was open, Bolton was amongst those who thought about factories, the earliest factories, in really imaginative ways so that they were places of, of great safety and welfare. So the walls were whitewashed. He, he worried about uh, the ventilation so that there was uh, good air. Um, there were good weekly wages paid for even the most humble workers there on a par uh, with skilled uh, craftsmen. Um, up there, a pound a day uh, for a skilled person. Um, he started the first insurance scheme uh, for workers, the Soho scheme. And that was just part of obviously what he did as a civic entrepreneur in the city, the creation um, as a partner in the canals, um, the pushing forward of the assay office, um, the creation of, of the mint. Um, it's no surprise that when he died and, and when he was buried, um, the whole city turned out to mourn. There were 10,000 people uh, who lined the road during Bolton's funeral. Um, and it was actually uh, James Watt's uh, son uh, who worked for the business uh, who wrote that after everybody spent a little bit of time drinking the memory of their departed benefactor standing in silence, they all repaired to their respective homes and not a Soho man was to be seen upon the road for the remainder of the day. It was a, a, an incredible uh, appeal that he built as that great civic entrepreneur. Now, we were not alone in this great reform program. Uh, we did have some competitors up in Manchester. In fact, in, in May 1789, we sold, Bolton and Watt sold their first steam engine to somebody called Peter Drinkwater. He was the first textile merchant to build um, a steam powered factory up in Manchester. Um, and his factory manager was somebody called Robert Owen, who then obviously went up to uh, Glasgow, pioneered in New Lanark Mills, um, some, some very powerful ideas that have still uh, helped inspire uh, labour thinking um, down to the day. But the reason that we could lay claim to the leading uh, centre of civic enterprise is because of what came after Bolton, and in particular the revolution that was instituted by George and Richard Cadbury from the 1860s onwards is what I think really enshrined our position as the kind of epicentre um, of a different way uh, of doing business, a kind of doing business that was in sharp contrast to the many of the worst excesses of Victorian capitalism at the time. Uh, the Cabris uh, pioneered ethical enterprise in this country on a magnificent scale, not only in the way that they created uh, in Bourneville, that famous factory um, in a village, but the way that they built a technical education system for their workers, the way that they built um, welfare services for their workers, the way in which they literally built brick by brick this extraordinary village in Bourneville designed to enshrine um, uh, the best of design, uh, a design that still inspires us um, to today. And much of that was inspired by the Cadbury's, Richard and George's own experience um, as civic entrepreneurs in the city, in the city's life, um, George's work as a teacher in adult education. In particular, George Cadbury was somebody who thought that uh, the physical environment that people lived in very much shapes their um, outlook and their possibilities uh, in life. I guess if he was a politician today, he may well have bought into this idea um, that the postcode where you're born should not define your possibilities in life. In the early 20th century, however, Birmingham, I think, lost its leadership role in um, driving this different kind of civic capitalism. And that's partly because uh, there were new entrepreneurs on the scene, uh, like William Lever up in um, uh, Port Sunlight near Liverpool, um, inspired by many of the things that Cadbury did, by the way. Um, but perhaps uh, Birmingham simply could not claim to boast an entrepreneur like John Speed and Lewis in creating the John Lewis partnership, created a very different kind of model of capitalism, um, which really sought to democratise uh, power and profit and information 
um, in radically new ways. And um, in the years after he died, uh, he could, looking down, be proud of the legacy of having created the biggest business on the high street. What's interesting, though, when you put these stories together is that you can see how after John Speed and Lewis's death in 1963, things in the economy, things in capitalism around the world began to take a very, very different direction. Uh, when I went to business school uh, in Harvard at the 1999-2000, um, uh, the first class you're taught for debate, admittedly, is Milton Friedman's lecture about how the only purpose of business um, is profit. The truth is that this philosophy of shareholder value came to dominate not only boardrooms, shareholder value came to dominate the investment management industry too. And it has created a kind of capitalism now, which creates vast inequalities, inequalities that are so significant now that Oxfam think that the top 1% of the world's population now owns about half of the world wealth. If that trend continues up until 2030, let's say, the top 1% won't simply own half of world wealth, they will own two thirds. That's about $215 trillion. And because of all of those conflicts, because of the anger, because of rising populism, because so many people have suffered through this kind of model, this model won't last for much longer in the 21st century. And this is my second point. It's the point really about the future. Today, the Club de Madrid, which is the international organization of former prime ministers and presidents, is meeting online um, to begin crystallizing what has become known um, in the public policy parlance as the new social contract. It's the idea that we have to create different ways to both share the burdens and the benefits of this world um, that we now live in. And the point that I often make in these talks is that uh, the idea of the new social contract is, is very nice. It's time to move it, however, from poetry to prose. We've actually got to start writing down what are the rights that each of us as citizens should enjoy in the 21st centuries? What are our responsibilities uh, to each other? What are our responsibilities uh, to the planet? Kate Raworth is amongst um, progressive economic, uh, economists who is doing a fantastic job in Amsterdam at defining what rights and responsibilities mean for citizens of the city. If I'm successful next year, we will try and bring Kate, Kate's approach uh, to setting rights and responsibilities here um, to the West Midlands. Contracts, however, have got to be paid for. And so as part of the debate that we have to have over the next couple of years, we've got to think radically about a different agenda for tax and crucially, a different agenda for inclusive capital markets. And this is where we begin to bring into focus the extraordinary opportunity uh, of Carl's work and the white paper uh, that you have launched uh, tonight. If we're to mobilize investment in kickstarting the economy through what will be the first global, the biggest global crash since the 1930s, we have got to channel money into infrastructure and businesses that do good. Businesses that help build stronger societies businesses that are serious about equality. The potential for this is enormous. Around the world, there is now $35 trillion under management in long-term investment management funds. We here in Britain have just hit a really important milestone because thanks to auto enrollment in pension schemes, we now have 12 million pension savers. I've just finished a piece of work with the Centre for Progressive Policy and the House of Commons Library, looking at how that will change long-term savings in this country. And it turns out that the average pension saver, that's the average worker, will have at peak about 72,000 pounds of equities in their pension savings portfolio. But right now, it is impossible for us as pension savers to make sure that we're investing that money in companies that aren't holding down wages, dodging their taxes, polluting the planet, or doing the wrong thing when it comes to race equality. This opportunity, this frustration, this paradox will soon become obvious to people. And as people begin to understand that they have this powerlessness about how their hard-earned savings are invested, they will begin to demand change. 
What will then ensue is a wholesale overhaul of corporate governance, of fiduciary duties, of financial reporting, and the way that the investment management industry works. Quite how long it will take, I'm not sure, but I think change could arrive much, much faster than we think. I would like to lead this corporate governance revolution, this corporate governance revolution that is required to democratize this great new opportunity from here in Birmingham and the West Midlands. And this is my third and, and final point, Deirdre. It's to bring the focus back to the code that Carl has so brilliantly introduced. Given our traditions in this city and in this region, we were the epicenter of civic capitalism. It was a standard that we set. It was a leadership that we lost. But given what is coming, there is a demand for this kind of leadership here again today. And Carl's work and your work, Deirdre, begin to show us how we can begin to map out this different kind of future. The final point I want to conclude with is the urgency of this politically. I serve one of the most diverse communities in the country, and it is the most income deprived community in England. It is three miles away from those towers uh, that are being built in the city centre. We live in a city where we have cranes in the sky, but we have homeless people in the doorways. That is an injustice that I do not think can persist. And when I watch in awe as our young people in this city organise the Black Lives Matter protests along with the Birmingham Youth Climate Strike, I know that I am looking at the most entrepreneurial generation that we have had in this city since the days of Matthew Bolton and James Watt. These young people are incredible. They are going to change the world. They are at the cutting edge of social change. They are clever, they are sophisticated, they are adroit, their communication skills are extraordinary. They are the, the we generation in the sense that they ask, what do we think of this? What do we think of that? They are naturally creative and collaborative as the digital natives that they are. So are we seriously saying that we are not going to reform the structures that stop children of some ethnicities contributing to this great task of progress that we have to pursue over the years to come. I cannot serve the diverse community that I represent unless we begin to bring forward the ideas that are in this code. And I saw this at first hand during the inquiry into fatalities in the ethnic minority community that I chaired over the last three months. Some of the hardest stories I've ever heard in public life, like the young mum who never got to hold her baby boy that she'd just given birth to before dying of COVID. A pastor's wife who found out that her husband she'd been married 50 years was about to die. She found out by text message she had 24 hours to live. The kids who said goodbye to their parents on WhatsApp as a doctor and a nurse held their hands as they breathed their last hours in Heartland's hospital. Are we seriously saying, are we seriously saying that after the agony of loss, after all the sacrifice, that we're just going to go back to business as usual? I don't think that is something that any of us could accept. And I have to say to you, one of our conclusions was that the power structures that we have in our public services and in our economy were a contributory factor to why more people in the ethnic minority community died of COVID than in the white community. The inequalities of power in the structures of our public life have consequences, both for economic possibilities and for health. So Digi, I just think that the work that you are helping bring forward is extraordinary. I want to thank you and Carl for the inspiration of your leadership. But my appeal is let's look at what is coming in the future. Let's look at the change that we know is going to be needed. And let's learn from the inspiration of our history and decide to be leaders. Carl has set out one of the ways in which we can do that. Let's grip it with both hands because we no longer live in an era of change. We are now living through a change of era and we need to think carefully about the possibilities and really try and seize them. I'll stop there. Thanks very much for listening.
Thank you so much, Liam. I think um, after that very inspiring speech, uh, Liam, I, I mean, I've, uh, this, this is obviously um, an area that much like Carl is close to my heart. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's quite an emotional arena to, to navigate um, as a professional and as a, an individual. And I think what I've really appreciated being a part of the Lunar Society, having served as the company secretary at the Bourneville Village Trust um, and having had the honor and privilege and benefit of learning and appreciating the values of the Cadbury's through that process. Um, and understanding what the original lunar men were all about. I think one of the, the key issues that's always been through it all has been that there's always a spirit of transformational sustainability and lasting change. There's always that key wanting to ensure that that occurs. Um, and I love what you said about ethical enterprise, because that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what we need to be doing. And that's exactly where we are now. And we have that opportunity to take back the ethics and the morality into the values of the governance frameworks within which we're operating so that we're not just about compliance. We're not just about tick boxing, but we are ensuring that we're moving forward ethically to effect that new social contract. So that being said, um, I've seen some questions coming through, but before I go to the questions, I'm actually going to ask everybody to unmute. And I think the speakers deserve uh, an old fashioned round of applause as if we were in the room together. So I, I'm, I'm leading that applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, and you know what's been wonderful about doing that applause? I've actually seen everybody's pictures and seen everybody coming up. This is so wonderful. And you know, I'm, I'm actually just gonna say very quickly before we move on that I will not apologize for the fact that at the, the first Lunar Society event that we can have where we're all meeting together, I will hug people so <laughs> I am not going to apologize <laughs> for that. So if you see me come to hug you, just, just embrace me as well. So um, it's now 7.51 and I did say that I wanted to, we were going to finish at eight o'clock, but I have had some private uh, chats asking if we could just maybe move it to just five minutes after. So we're going to take about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and comments um, to the, the speakers. And then um, I will close by just doing a, a, just a short wrapping up and, and leaving the last word for Liam and, um, and Carl. So I've seen um, in the chat, we've had a question from Patricia McCabe. And Patricia, I, um, I don't know if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question or whether you'd like me to ask for you. I'd like you to ask for me, please. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so Patricia has asked, um, is it time for Birmingham to regain its leading role with race equality at the center? So I'll put that to Liam first. Yes, without a doubt. And um, we can do this in two ways next year. So. You know, I've, I've said to Carl, you know, look, if, if, if I'm successful as a, as a public leader next year, we will incorporate it into what the combined authority does. Um, but second, we will try and um, kind of put the ripples behind it by asking um, the public sector across our region, which spends, I don't know, north of 16 billion a year. Um, we will ask the public sector to only purchase goods and services from organisations that adopt the race code. Um, and I just think that you know this is one of the things that we should be known for um I don't, I don't know if carl is going to go for this or not but i mean i just i i, I would love it to be known as a, as a thing that was made in the midlands you know I, I would love to have that kind of um 
uh, that hallmark on it, I think, because, you know, when the Commonwealth Games does happen, we're going to have a billion people watching us and we better be ready with some good stories to tell. And I would love this story to be one of them. To add to that? Sorry, Carl, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, and there's someone who may need to mute in the background, actually. Oh, yes, I think uh, Rob, Neil, so sorry, would you mind muting? <laughs> sorry, Rob? Yes, I was saying that <laughs> the... The Made in Birmingham, Made in the West Midlands, definitely is one of the things that we're really proud of, trying to make sure that we have something that we can demonstrate is like we've seen in the past, is leading and Birmingham leading. And I think it's a moment in time where we've got a topic area that we're all in agreement to come to the right. And here's the topic that we can learn. learn, learn. Okay, thank you, Carl. Thank you. I think we've, yes, so we've also had a question from Peter Ford Bartolo, um, the vice chair of the Lunar Society. Peter, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes, um, hang on. Uh, basically, it's a little bit of a flat line slasher that we can have equality. The Lever Brothers and the Cadbury Brothers that were both, history um, is being made every day. But it's not just the story of black people. Um, the Lever the Brothers and the Cadbury Brothers were both um, Quakers. Um, should um, morality be a ground base of um, uh, governance? Absolutely brilliant. Excellent. Uh, old, old fashioned mobile phone. <laughs> I love I love how we could use old fashioned technology. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, Rob. So Peter, would you mind asking your question again, please? Sorry. Thank you. Um, the um, Lever Brothers and the um, uh, the Cadbury Brothers were both Quaker families. Um, should morality be the uh, basis for good governance? Uh, Carl, would you like to, to answer, should morality be the basis of good governance? I'm going to say, of course, I'm going to say business ethic. Um, Bob Tricker's just written a very recently a new book, Bob Tricker, who came up with this term or statement that I'd like to share, which is, if you want to find out which people are good in the boardroom, it says boards are incompetent groups of competent individuals. It's Bob Tricker that talks about the fact that it's more than the systems, it's more than the policies, it's about board behavior. And I think business ethics and morality should be at the center. And not because it's a nice thing to do. As I mentioned with triple context, we have to make sure that we understand it's not just about profitability. And Liam talked about civic capitalism. I think what we've got to think about as communities is how we make sure that we're getting those three lines of defense all at the same time. Mm. Thank you. Liam, would you like to add yeah. to that? Uh, so, so, so George Cadbury once said, um, uh, I, I have only done what is the duty of every employer and, and Christian citizen. Um, every employer, the duty of every employer. And he brought his um, ethical framework into work. And it's a powerful reminder that we get into trouble when we behave as divided selves. So if we leave our humanity at the threshold of our business and try and behave as if we are some kind of cyborg, profit maximizing cyborg inside, then that is bad for us as human beings. We have to, I think, kind of remember that businesses like financial markets, like any kinds of markets, they're human institutions. They're not made up of some kind of platonic furniture. 
they're made up of institutions which are human. And because they are human, they have to have human ethics at their core and at their heart. We as humans design the institutions, we design the laws, we design the institutions that govern the way that economies behave. Um, businesses are exactly the same. They are economic institutions for sure, but they are designed and built and operated uh, by humans. Um, and so I think that people are beginning to see a little bit more clearly now that trying to run corporations um, as a divided self is, um, it's, it's, it's bad for your health, it's certainly bad for your mental health, but it's certainly bad for society too. Um, and organisations like Blueprint for Better Business um, that have a very uh, Aristotelian framework of ethics as a way of thinking about codes of conduct and codes of behaviour um, are really quite important innovators in this space. Um, but um, yeah, you know, if, if, if we want to dehumanise business, then you leave morality at the boardroom door. But I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think many people would want to live in a country that was um, run like that. Uh, that, that, that I, I agree with you entirely. And um, I think that it's very ambitious, Carl, to have the three lines of defense together. Ooh, okay. <laughs> we, we are definitely, well, I'm up for the challenge. So I'm sure the organizations are too. Um, I have, I'm going to leave uh, it to Clive Stone to just make one further comment. Um, and then I think we will move to um, our closing remarks. So Clive. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, we've just been speaking about ethics and humanity. Um, I had the privilege of, of, of knowing Sir Adrian on, for a long time, um, both on a personal and business basis. If you are looking at an exemplar of someone who was quite bluntly a genius when it came to business ethics, but also an incredibly nice individual who did not believe in confrontation. He believed in equality for everybody and he was respected by everybody. I think you could go no further. It, it, is, it is something that we must never forget about Sir Adrian, that not only was he a intellectual powerful individual, but as a human being, he was an incredibly nice one as well. Thank you so much, Clive. I think that's the perfect note on which we can end this evening. So I'm going to ask Carl first and then Liam um, to just give us in one minute or less <laughs> their, um, their closing thoughts on the future in relation to race equality and um, and their hopes. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming on to this tonight. And I, I must say again, I feel so privileged to be here at the Sir Adrian Cadbury lecture and to have known Sir Adrian Cadbury. Um, I'm going to say something, not about governance, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say my latest blog, I've said I'm going to call it You're On Mute. Um, I'm going to change it now, and it has gone out, it has gone out, it goes out tomorrow, and it's called You're On Mute, so have a look for it, my monthly blog, but Rob, I'm going to change it to You're Not On Mute, <laughs> so that's going to be the new catchphrase for me, You're Not On Mute, and I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Liam? I um, am just going to kind of underline the importance of this, I'm going to share... Um, uh, the, the new digital platform for the parliamentary network on the IMF and the World Bank that I launched uh, a couple of weeks ago um, at our annual meetings because the stakes are really, really high. Um, the truth is that in the next 10 years, we're not just going to have to try and steer a recovery uh, from COVID. Um, we're going to have to combat what I've called the three rises, the rise in temperature, the rise in technology and the rise in trade conflict. And each one of those um, movements is going to be incredibly difficult politically to navigate and the only way that we are going to be able to get through those that, that labyrinth that lies ahead is if we find good ways to stick together and maximize the contribution that each of us is empowered to make to this great business called human progress and unless we address the structural 
racism that we have in our country, we deny ourselves the contribution of millions of people who have just so much to give and to offer and whose contribution is mission critical to us navigating the changes that are ahead. So the stakes are high um, and let's invent the solutions here in Birmingham. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liam. You know, I, I'm just so um, I'm, I'm I'm thrilled and excited and and so pleased with how the evening has gone. And I think everyone will agree with me that not only was it um, inspirational and inspiring, it was very honest, very transparent, and very robust. Very much in keeping with the traditions of the Lunar Society and with our views on the future, keeping in line with Sir Adrian's accountability for the future and certainly the Lunar Society's heritage for the future. And with that being said, I would very much welcome those of you who are not already members of the Lunar Society to join us because we are on a movement of transformational change and this organization has been this way from the moment of its conception and we don't want anybody left behind and we certainly want to, to have that intelligence capital to effect change like Liam says and like Carl says from here in Birmingham. I mean, you can tell from my accent that I'm not a Brummie, but I would like to think that I'm an honorary Brummie. And certainly when I moved here, I realized very quickly that I was in the center of the universe. So I would very, very much um, love to, to welcome those of you who are not members. And I very much do appreciate those of you who are members for the incredible work that you have been doing, particularly in this COVID period. We've had many events online. We've had huge participation. And indeed, even in our newsletters, the, the level of participation uh, in, in the newsletters has been incredible. So I do thank you. We will be... Um, taking a slight hiatus over November, but we will be coming back in December with a number of events, including our Matthew and Bolton um, lecture. And that's going to be incredible. And as I was discussing with Liam earlier, um, hopefully we'll have an annual dinner in the spring when we can all meet together. And I promise you, I will be doing those hugs. So I was just, it's left for me to say, again, a heartfelt thank you to our speakers, a heartfelt thank you to the George Cadbury Fund and the Cadbury family for making this event possible and for opening up themselves to allow us to celebrate Sir Adrian Cadbury in this way tonight. And a heartfelt thank you to Aston University for continuing to host us even in this virtual world. So everyone have a fantastic evening. Safe journeys to your kitchens or to your hallways. <laughs> and I very much look forward to seeing you again soon. So lastly, I will just ask everybody to unmute. You can say goodbye, you can clap and say goodbye. Robin, say this. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.